white soil. Daddy lay back, daddy lay back, take me your side, take me your side, take me turn around the council, heave a hole, heave a hole. Now the ship station boys be hand, be hands. Down the about the rise around the horn. Down the about the rise around the horn. to one before, we encourage you to check the website, um, easthamptonhistory.org, every fall or every winter and see when the dates are for the winter lectures. They generally run January, February, March, sometimes there's one in April. This year, this year there happens to be two in March. Um, so, um, you know, we, we usually are at the um, uh, Baldwin Lecture Room at the East Hampton Library. Um, and we're very grateful to the Life Saving Station for letting us do this one here. I thought this is a great spot, right? Yeah. Um, we just, yeah. We thank you for being here. We remind you that your, your membership in the East Hampton Historical Society is what allows us to do these programs for free. So we uh, value your membership. If you're not a member, you can certainly find out how to be one going on the website as well. So tonight, um, first I want to tell you next next week or next month, April 28th at seven at the Baldwin Lecture Room in the East Hampton Library. Um, Hugh King and Evan Thomas, who always do a, a great program for us, are going to be talk, talking to us about architects, builders, and tools in the 19th and 20th century. Our theme for this year was um, the uh, people in East Hampton at work. So we've talked about. Um, We've talked about whalers, we've talked about millers, we've talked about blacksmiths, and these are our last two tonight and April 28th, so please feel free to come to that as well. Um, I just want to introduce David, who I've known since he was a very little boy. <laughs> David is a, 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 a teacher at East Hampton Middle School. He's uh, on the Education Committee of East Hampton Historical Society. He's on the board of the Life Saving Station here, and is, he's an East Hampton Town Trustee. And wow. we're so happy to have him tonight, and we know you're going to enjoy this program. Thank you so much, Barbara. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. I don't lose my whole voice singing, but... Uh, Thanks so much for coming down to the dunes tonight, you know, checking out Damagansett, it's an historical building. If these walls could only talk, imagine the stories they tell. So I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about history tonight. And um, thanks so much for Nick Epstein for playing with me. <laughs> kind of set the mood here for whaling. A lot of those songs were sung all over the world on sailing ships from Sag Harbor. The talk tonight is going to be on whaling off our beaches. So. We can stop. We can still use those songs. So, um, so hold on to your seats. I'm about to take you for a Nantucket sleigh ride into the history of shore whaling here in East Hampton. Now, when we think of whales, we consider them something that we should share the oceans with, you know, to help survive. Um, but these feelings are actually quite modern. In the past, humans and whales had a much different relationship. People had chased the giant creatures without remorse for millennia. Whales were hunted for many reasons and have humans have systematically been wiping them out right, from right. one ocean to the next. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Today we have a much better understanding of their environmental health and we prioritize animals' rights. But in the old days, humans mistakenly believed that the vast oceans and its resources were bottomless. The desire for wealth from whales pushed these creatures to the very verge of extinction. Why? Primarily because of their blubber. The products made from whale blubber oil were unlike anything else of their time. They could be used for lighting lamps and machine. <laughs> All right, I'll just, I'll, okay, this keeps working. Right, I'm not going to move. All right, so, they can be used for lighting lamps, machine lubrication, and different from any substance on Earth. Long before whaling ships from Sag Harbor 
crisscross the globe in search of whale oil, there is the story of shore whaling, or, us, or as us bonnikers called it, to go off a whaling. From 1650 until 1917, when a whale was spotted from East Hampton, there was a familiar call we used. If some lonely lookout on the dunes happened to spy a cluster of whale spouts, he or she would pass the word to the villagers by yelling, Well off! Well off! This phrase was repeated again and again until word spread like wildfire. So if you hear me, shout tonight, Well off! Please echo me. Well off! Ready? Well off! Well off! All right, we have a fine crew here tonight, but hold on to your harpoons for now. I've got a little more to tell. Now, the simplest definition of shore whaling is harvesting whales that either wash up on the beach or are spotted from land. In these cases, whalers would launch small boats in an attempt to kill and tow the whale back to land. Bones, baleen, meat, but mainly oil from blubber was the goal of shore whaling. To a large extent, shore whaling really boosted East Hampton onto the world stage and created its first serious source of sustainable, lucrative income. I think it could be said that shore whaling helped early East Hampton not just survive, but really thrive. And, but I'll get into that in a little bit. As you probably know, whales have been around for 50 million years. They've evolved into 90 different species that we have today. By the way, the largest creature on Earth ever existed was a whale. Does anyone know what type of whale? Blue whale. You got it, the blue whale. So, whales were split into two major groups. Those with teeth, who, um, so think about sperm whales and orca who prey on large fish, and those with baleen who strain water through brush-like filters to slurp down tiny fish and krill. Think right whales and humpbacks. There's also some baleen right on the other side of that screen. Pull it up a little bit, thanks. Um, so these are right whales and humpbacks. And the, the right whale, the northern right whale, was the prime, the prime um, whale that bonnikers would be trying to um, Hunts off our beaches. So roughly 10,000 years ago, after, after the last ice ages, as the planet slowly warmed and the ocean rose, Long Island was formed. Archaeological evidence of early native islanders here goes back at least 6,000 years. The Montauk and the Shinnecock ancestors have been hunting whales for thousands of years off our beaches. Here's a rendering of a mica stone tablet from around the time of Christ, about 2,000 years old here, found by a farmer in Brookhaven in 1615, 1865. The carving symbolizes a whale-like creature surrounded by the tail fins of whales and was probably used for ceremonial purposes. The first close-up encounter between people and whales was likely not at sea, but on a beach where a whale, either dead or dying, had washed ashore. No doubt this was astonishing and possibly frightening to the local inhabitants but it probably didn't take long for those natives to figure out the bounty a beach whale contained. Food, lamp oil, bones and teeth for all sorts of tools and building materials. Native islanders would boil the blubber and mix the oil with their corn and beans. They would also rub the oil into animal hides as a preservative. Whale jerky could be eaten all year long. The rendered oil from an adult right whale could light a Montauk village for an entire year. A simple lamp with a clamshell filled with oil and a wick twisted of moss. There you have it. The Montaukets and the Shinnecocks were part of a larger Algonquin nation, which stretched from Delaware to Massachusetts. We still have many Algonquin words today. Amagansett, Napig, Chipmunk, Opossum, Raccoon, and Canoe are all examples. When it was native land, Eastern Long Island was at the heart of a watery domain, a vast trading network that connected Cape Cod Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Block Island, Fisher's Island, etc. This network was connected by expert native watermen in massive dugout canoes. These unsinkable crafts were cut and burned out of giant, ancient Tupelo trees. Tupelo wood is tough, buoyant, and doesn't soak up water. Now, <clears throat> we're not talking about tiny, thin-skinned birch bark canoes, but 50-footers that could easily hold up to a ton of targo, cargo and were crewed by as many as 40 men with stout wooden whalebone paddles. 
A few of these old whalebone paddles have been found in grave sites of Long Island Algonquins, meaning they were probably a favorite tool of the deceased. The canoes themselves often had intricate carvings that were painted elaborate colors. These giant war canoes traversed Long Island Sound and other coastal waterways and rivers, mostly for trading. Think of these as the Amazon delivery trucks of their day. <laughs> Speaking of trade, Shinnecock and, Shinnecock and Montauk wampum was an es, uh, economic item that was highly coveted. It brought prosperity to the tribes here, keeping them at the center of the trade network. Bottom line, hunting a whale in open water would be all in a day's work for these hardy watermen of yesterday. According to David, David Gardner, Lion Gardner's son, the Montauk Indians sacrificed the tail and fins to gain the favor of Manitou, their most powerful god. In an elaborate ceremony, wrote Gardner, the tail and fins were roasted and eaten. The shaman then led a great and prolonged powwow and religious festival. There are frequent references to tails and fins of whales in Indian deeds and leases. The sachems reserved the rights to the tails and fins of whales that washed ashore for many years after the English arrived. The native tribes had a concern for balance in nature that was expressed in their rituals, honoring the spirits of animals taken by hunters. There was even a whale god named Mushup, a giant, a giant of a man who legend says barehandedly caught and killed whales and left them on the shore for native people. Old Indian tales even claim the red stained cliffs of Montauk are from the blood of Mushup's whales. Here's one of the earliest known descriptions of a Long Island Indian whale hunt told by English explorer George Weymouth in 1615. They are truly masters of the wind and waves. Their manner of killing the whale, which they call Powdawi, is like this. The natives go out in the company of their king with a multitude of boats and strike him with a long spear with bone made in the fashion of a harpoon fastened to a rope, which they make strong with the woven bark of trees, which they let out after him. Then all their boats come about him, and as he shakes about the water, with their arrows and spears they shoot him to death. When they have killed him and dragged him to shore, they call all their chief sachems together and sing a, si a song of joy. Also, in some cases, seal skins would be attached to the harpoon line to slow the whale down. Roger Williams in 1643 reported, whales were cut up in several pieces and sent near and far. And he remarked about the Indians' abilities in handling canoes beyond the surf. It is wonderful to see how they will venture in those canoes into any sea. Due to their long history of whaling and deep connection to the ocean, Native Americans made some of the best whalers hand down, hands down, and that tradition would continue into the 16, 17, and 1800s when Montauk and Shinnecox were highly valued as whalemen and harpooners. To this day, when there is a beach whale, a member of the Shinnecox Nation will visit the site to say prayers and blessings to the spirit of the dead animal. This ritual is thousands of years old. Captain John Smith, of Jamestown fame reported sighting large numbers of whales on a scouting exploration around Long Island and New England in 1615. He shared this information back home in England and added to the growing fascination of settling the new world. Whales could be big business and help support and pay for the growing number of European colonies, and this is exactly what happened right here in East Hampton. Practically, as soon as the first settlers arrived in East Hampton in 1640, they began to harvest beached whales. The profits gained from harvesting the drift whales on the town beaches prompted early settlers to explore hunting whales offshore. It didn't take long for them to find out that the local Indians were experts at hunting whales in canoes, and soon the Montaukens and the Shinnecocks were giving lessons to the English in exchange for European goods like guns, metal tools, coats, and rum. Next, early East Hampton leaders began organizing groups of men called companies designed to pursue the highly coveted northern right, North Atlantic right whale that swam close to shore from November to March. As opposed to the Puritan pilgrims of Massachusetts, Long Island was first settled by the Dutch West India Company to make a profit. Folks in Long Island quickly found that the whaling business would help their tiny outpost at Manhattan, called New Amsterdam. 
They set up whaling stations on Long Island, and by far the most profitable came from eastern Long Island, sticking out like a giant thumb into the migrating pods of whales. The Dutch lost New York to the English twice, the second time in 1672. By then, whaling on eastern Long Island had begun to attract considerable notice. Royal governors for the next 100 years gave it close attention and demanded growing taxes on whale oil for the blossoming industry in Southampton and East Hampton. And England deemed whales, they were called the royal, wet, the royal fish. Almost immediately after East Hampton was established in 1648, whaling companies emerged. Settlers worked with local natives, and an agreement was made in 1667 with the Shinnecock that the town was to pay the Indians five pounds of wampum for each Indian cap for each whale captured. Colonial whalers relied heavily on the talent and strength of Indians who were hired seasonally as contract workers. Fishing and farming was a living for East Hampton, but whale oil meant prosperity and a ready export for trade to Europe. Money was scarce. Taxes were paid in wheat, wampum, cattle, whale oil, and Indian corn. The robust purchasing power of whale oil is demonstrated in 1701 when Daniel Miller, with his sons and enslaved, Af enslaved Africans, took one whale and sold enough oil to buy a large farm in Springs. Ever wonder why East Hampton had more windmills than most of colonial Long Island, or maybe the whole East Coast? They were expensive and intric intricate to construct, but because of that extra income from whaling, our founding fathers found a clever way of reinvesting in themselves with whale money, growing large fields of corn and grains and building windmills to mill them. Best of all, whaling and farming complemented each other perfectly because they each took place in opposite seasons, farming in the summer and whaling in the winter. In our day and age, it's hard to, it's hard to grasp the importance of whale oil back before electricity, but it was by far the most superior source of light. It burned slowly, was very bright, and gave off little smoke. Tallow candles made from animal fat in early colonial times were only for the very wealthy. Pitch pine slivers were also burned but gave off little light and lots of smoke. If the town was lucky enough to find a sperm whale, the waxy spermaceti from the cavity of the head made a superior candle. When mixed with oil and bayberry, the candles not only glowed but filled the home with a perfume scent. The bones of the whale could be used to make buttons, corset stays, and handles. Whalebone shavings were used in stuffing the best upholst upholstered furniture as it was very springy. <laughs> Whale meat, supposedly if cooked and eaten right away, was tender and tasted like beefsteak. <laughs> Mince pies with whale meat was an Amagansett specialty. <laughs> whale oil was also in high demand for lubricating fine gears and watches, clocks, and other tools. The famous Domini clocks were greased with it. Whale oil was also used to make soap and even margarine. Yum! <laughs> Samuel Maverick wrote in 1669, On the east end of Long Island, 13 whales were taken before the end of March, and here they are daily seen in Gardner's Bay. The other week, a small boat struck two whales but lost both. The iron broke in one, the other broke the line. Daniel Denton, in 1670, said, Upon the sh south shore of Long Island in the winter lie stores of whales, which the inhabitants have begun with, no, with small boats to make a trade catching to their no small benefit. From 1650 to 1680, the amount of whales taken each year slowly grew as the colonial whalers became more knowledgeable and hired more Indians to help. By 1680, Amagansett was the most profitable ocean town for whaling on the entire East Coast. Not New Bedford, not Nantucket, not Sag Harbor, but our little old Amagansett, right here 12 generations ago. In 1687, there were 12 companies engaged in whaling on the South Fork. By then, East Hampton trustees were up and running, and they tried to help govern the disputed whaling beaches. Even to this day, East, East Hampton trustees still have their hands full with beach access rights. <laughs> so intense was the competition for whales that a boundary had to be set between East Hampton and its neighbor, Southampton. Drift whales and day-long whaling expeditions were now big business, and the profit from those whales fueled not only lamps, but the economy of whole towns. Adult right whales were a lucrative quarry, quarry producing from 30 to 50 barrels of oil. The profits from one right whale could buy a medium-sized farm in East Hampton. 
The right whale got its name because it was the right whale. Clever, right? <laughs> Here's why it was the best whale. Generally docile and relatively slow moving, right whales were easily approached by men in boats. Right whales rarely dive for long periods and tend to surface close to where they last submerged. On being killed rather than sink, like other whales, the right whale usually floated, giving its attackers the ability to secure ropes and tow it back to shore for processing. Best of all, the right whale produced copious amounts of oil, baleen, and meat, all items in high demand. The right whale can grow to a length of 60 feet and can weigh up to 100 tons. Its enormous mouth, which takes up a quarter of its body, is an incredible mechanism for obtaining food. Hanging down from its top jaws are hundreds of strips of baleen up to 10 feet long. Swimming with its mouth wide open, the right whale takes in huge drafts of water filled with small fish and krill. Having corralled its meal, it closes its mouth and thrusts up its massive tongue against the baleen, capturing its lunch while straining out the seawater. With a swallow, the feeding loop continues until the whale's mighty hunger is satisfied. It may consume two to three tons of fish in one meal. Baleen is made of keratin, similar in texture to your fingernails. This was in high demand for corset stays, buggy whips, hairbrushes, umbrellas, and other products requiring strength and flexibility. Before there was plastic, there was baleen. Remember, shore whaling was done primarily in the winter um, because the right whale's migrations. Every October, the Arctic freeze reduces the whale's supply of krill, so they swim south following the Atlantic coast to spawn in the warmer waters off the Carolinas and Georgia coast. Whales remain in those waters until February when they return north to their feeding grounds in the Arctic. Whale off! Whale off! I said they're gentle, they've left alone, but once harpooned, however, right whales could become extremely dangerous adversaries with surprising speed and tremendous force and agility. The mammal could swing its powerful tail in a huge arc and smash a boat to kindling, killing and drowning its crew almost chasing this giant, a shadow Can you imagine, for a moment, into its own solid, watery realm? What nerve and devotion to your family and community it must have taken to paddle out. Just imagine what these early men felt like being 15 miles offshore in the middle of a freezing winter night, wind and snow blowing against them as their tiny boat is pulled farther into the darkness by an angry behemoth. Ocean temps in the winter are in the 40s, so men were constantly surrounded by almost sudden death. If they went in, and that certainly happened. These were brave and hardy men, to say the least, men who were encouraged by their fathers, uncles, or brothers who sat beside them. This would have been when they sung sea shanties, to keep the <laughs> rhythm of their own harmony and to keep their spirits up against the cold and dark. By the way, I use the term men because in all my research, I haven't come across one woman to go off a whaling in East Hampton. But if anyone knows about that, <laughs> let me know. But there was one famous woman um, from up island in Smith Point, Madam Martha Turnstall Smith, who when her husband was killed by a whale, took over his company as captain with her Shinnecock crew and averaged 10 whales a winter for the next decade. That's one tough woman. <laughs> now, the, East, the women of East Hampton were strong-willed and independent. And records show that they were an intricate part of the whaling processing, working tirelessly beside their men. Often women would also watch for whales at the lookout stations or patrol the beaches on foot or horseback. Abigail Baker was on patrol one day in 1707, riding her horse along the beach from East Hampton to Bridgehampton and sighted 13 whales. She must have made a tidy profit because the first to give the whale alarm was always rewarded with some share of the spoils. But typically, it was the men who actually paddled out and matched their wits and puny strength against their enormous adversary. The joy of winning a battle with the sea seems to have outweighed its ever-present risks and danger. Like big wave surfers or mountain climbers, some whalemen might have been thrill-seekers to some degree, as young men tend to be. Early death records from endless entries from Presbyterian Church in East Hampton List drowned, lost at sea, crushed by a whale, or went out for a whale, never came back. February 24th, 1719, Minister Nathaniel Hunting from the Presbyterian Church sadly recorded, This day a whale boat, being alone, struck a whale, and she coming under ye boat, staved it in, and though ye men were not hurt with the whale, yet before any help came to them, four men were tired and chilled, and fell off ye boat and oars to which they hung and were drowned. Henry Parsons, William Schellinger, Lewis Mulford and Jeremiah Conkling Jr. all perished this day from a whale. 
Another tragic inscription in an old Mulford family account book is this entry. The night before Daniel Baker was drowned out wailing, his wife dreamed the tide rose so high that it came up to the house, burst open a door, and brought in a coffin. She requested him not to go off wailing that day. She said she was afraid some accident would happen. He replied, I think I will still go out today, but I won't go out anymore. <laughs> Daniel should have listened to his wife because he did indeed drown that day after a whale crushed his boat. Every man, woman, and child in early East Hampton was connected to whaling. Debts were paid in whale oil and whale bone. The ministers, schoolmasters, salaries were partially paid in whale byproducts. School was let out when a whale was spotted because every able Bonnie Boniker in town had to do his or her share in the whale catch or processing. African Americans, both free and enslaved, were another important part of the whaling industry, but are seldom mentioned in our town's whaling history. Whaleboat captains recruited natives on the hunt, even setting up contracts with them. The first whaling contracts were entered in the Southampton Town Records in 1670. Two entrepreneurs, Josiah Langton and John Howell, recruited native whalers for the season by offering them coats, shoes, stockings, powder, shot, and corn. The following season, four more contracts were negotiated on similar terms, and this system went on for decades and decades. The native whalers signed on for a season and then began to purchase goods on their credit line from the captain. By the time the season was over, they might be in debt for more than they had earned that year, keeping the Indian whalers in a form of continued servitude to pay off their debts. This system gave the owners complete control over all transactions. Beaches were divided into sections from Montauk Point to Southampton. Groups of families or companies were assigned the beach closest to them, and they took turns watching for whales. For example, the Wayne Scott Dumplings, East Hampton Village, Amagansett each had their own companies. Usually from the highest dunes, or in some cases, high platforms were built, where the watcher would have a better view of the surrounding ocean. Back then, most locals worth their salt would know the type of a whale a mile away by simply observing the spout. Each whale species has a distinctive spout. Northern Atlantic right whales have a double blowhole that spouts in a very distinctive V-shape. Humpback whales have a single blowhole with a balloon-shaped spout nearly as wide as high, and sperm whales have a uniquely angled spout from blowhole on the left side of the head. When a whale was spotted, the watcher would yell, Whale off! Whale off! And point, and hoist up a flag, usually a white flag. And they'd be maybe on the lookout from their rooftops, going up through the scuttle hole, and they'd be able to spot the flag and send the word. Uh, this set in motion exciting chain of reaction and activity. Soon horns would be sounded, and whale off would be heard as town folks hurried to their appointed tasks. Next, boats and equipment would be carted down to the beach by horses or oxen. Ideally, there would be two to three boats that set off after the whales. The typical whale boat was 28 feet long by 6 feet across, basically the size of the BB rescue boat here at this museum, which we took outside for you all to be in here, but usually it's, it's right in the middle. Um, in fact, the Coast Guard rescue surf boats were modeled after the early predecessor, the whale boat. And this boat with overlapping cedar planking design called the clinker method differed little from the strong and pliable vessels used by those ingenious Vikings over a thousand years ago. The both were tough yet flexible, sharp at bow and stern to cut through the sharp, the steep surf. Most whaling boats also carried a collapsible mast and sail to use if the wind was favorable. I read a few accounts when a whale boat would be sailing alongside a swimming whale matching speed before harpooning it. Since whaling season was during the winter, the men dressed warmly. Woolen socks underneath, heavy hand-knit wool socks, uh, a thick flannel shirt, an old suit of clothes, hip boots, heavy pea jacket, and a cap with ear flaps. Wool mittens were an important item as wool stays warm when wet. Men typically also grew long hair and full beards. This picture is not from uh, local, this is from the Pacific or something, right? <laughs> Once in the water, the captain in the stern steered the boat using a long steering oar. The four men in the middle each had their own 15-foot oar, and the harpoonist in the bow also had an oar, though shorter. Under the commands of the captain, they would chase the whale as fast as they could. When a whale would dive, an experienced captain would still follow the giant mammal's movement <clears throat> below from rising bubbles and a slight oily residue that appeared on the surface above the swimming whale. The oarlocks were covered in leather and generously greased to reduce <coughs> creaking and alerting their quarry. Whales have extremely good hearing and some of the widest hearing ranges of any animal, uh, mammal. Excuse me. 
If all went well, the small boat would get as close to the well as possible. And before the well realized what was happening, the first mate in the bow threw or jabbed a harpoon into the well towards the head or the back. Ideally, the barb of the harpoon catches into the thick blubber, and the well and the well boat are connected. The harpoon was 11 feet long and made from the best hand-wrought iron, tempered just right, so that it could get twisted and bent, but never break. The header dart went through many evolutions over the centuries. So this is the original harpoons. And then they came out with the toggle, which is, a, so once it went inside, the hinge would open and it would have a much better um, hold on the whale. And then the center is the lance, that's, that, I'll get to that. <clears throat> if possible, the boat, another boat would get a harpoon into the whale, so they would be even more secure. As soon as they were fastened, the captain would yell, back oars, and the boat would ease back off, because as you can imagine, the whale became furious and would roll and thrash around. This was the most dangerous time when men and boats could easily be crushed. The rope, over a thousand feet long, coiled in a wooden tub, played out as the whale struggled to break free. The heat of the friction from the running rope on the wood could create a fire if not doused with seawater continuously. After this initial spasm of anger and frustration, the whale might take off into deeper water, pulling the boat and the men along up to speeds of 25 miles an hour. This was the famous Nantucket sleigh ride. Once in deeper waters, the whale could also dive, and the men would have a knife or hatchet ready to cut the line at the last moment before the entire boat and crew were pulled down into the murky depths of the freezing ocean. After what could be a few minutes or many hours, the whale had tired itself out enough to stop moving and the whale boat crept up quietly. This time the honor went to the captain to make the final kill. This was done with a 15 foot lance with an extremely long sharp blade. The captain would stab into the whale to puncture its heart or lungs. He would do this as many times as possible until the whale was dying and spouted blood, known as fire in the chimney. In some cases, the captain would climb onto the whale's back and serve the coup de grace from atop the massive victim. Ideally, the whale floated back and was towed to the beach by its tail. Another way a harvest whale made it to the beach was if the wind was from the southwest, which, as you know, is our predominant wind in East Hampton. It's a perfect wind to blow the floating prize back to the nearest beach. Sometimes, <coughs> this would take a few days, Usually, whales were left to drift ashore if there were more whales killed than whale boats, or in some cases, the weather became too dangerous to tow in the whale. Sudden blizzards or nor'easters caused more than a few boats to race home, some never making it back to safety. If a whale was set to drift ashore, the harpoon was left stuck in the whale, which had the initials or the symbol of the owner, like a reserve sign that everyone respected. They were supposed to. Although I read a few incidents where East Hampton whales drifted west to Bridgehampton or Southampton. On more than one occasion, rival whale, whale crews fought it out over the massive carcass. Let's just say many harpoons were not returned. <laughs> this began a rivalry with East Hampton and South Hampton that still exists today. Go Bonnick. <laughs> Oftentimes, when a whale was spied being towed to shore, other small boats might paddle out from the beach. They would bring water to the, and food to the tired, hungry whalemen. In some cases, the exhausted and battered men trade places with new, fresh hands. These were often teenagers who were strong enough to tow in a dead whale, but not old enough to join in the hunt. As remembered by Everett Edwards in 1891, we watched from the high sand dunes as father and Uncle Jess's boat started to tow the big whale in. Then came a 12-hour pull. They could only row about a mile an hour. They were still about six miles off the land at 4 o'clock when Dan Loper, myself, and three other boys rowed out with water and food for all hands. The men had left home early in the morning with nothing to eat or drink and were glad to see us. When we boys got out there and found Ben was hurt and unable to row, I took his place and he came ashore in the dory, which was quickly rowed back to the beach. The final stage of the towing had to be coordinated with the tide because the carcass needed to become to rest as high up on the beach as possible. The men towed the whale and tail first and anchored it against the pull of the falling tide. Once exposed on the tidal flats, the crew began the process of butchering. Raise your hand if you ever filleted a fish here. Anybody? Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it takes some skill and it's pretty messy, right? So now imagine filleting a 150,000 pound whale with up to 50 men helping in the processing. It could take three days to fleece one whale. First, they severed the head with axes and boat spades. The boat spade resembled a shovel with a flat razor sharp blade. The workers removed the baleen from the mouth and then turned to the messy business of removing the blubber. 
Using the boat spade, the men cut the blubber into strips called flensing. The two foot thick and six foot long blubber slabs would be hooked and peeled off by men together on winches and pulleys. This would have been another great time to sing a sea shanty. Right, Nick? <laughs> they would load these long, thick, marble-colored slabs onto horse or ox carts that would be wheeled to the local triworks. There, the huge hunks would be chopped up into smaller, more manageable chunks and boiled or tried into huge 250-gallon kettles on a stone furnace. As the oil melted out, the blubber, as the oil melted out of the blubber, it was skimmed off and poured into cooling vats. The men scooped the scraps of whale oil out and used them to fuel the fire. The stuff was called crackling and was supposedly pretty tasty. It was said that a whale could cook itself with its own skin. I think it might be a little bit like when you fry up bacon and there's all that oil in the bottom. When the oil cooled, it was poured into wooden barrels for shipment to Boston, New York, or London, etc. As you can imagine, it was dirty, smelly business. The odor was so pungent that trying stations were always located some distance from the nearest village or homestead. Boat crews worked in shifts around the clock for as long as a week. The main tri works in Amagansett, which was used for decades, was just around the corner from here where the Mar Marine Museum is today. And this photo is from that. And here's some of the... It was an unwritten law in East Hampton that no alcohol was allowed on the well hunts. Every man needed to be as his sharpest, quick-witted, with all senses at full capacity to have a chance at a well. But once back on dry land with a well, it seems that a festive air was invoked. Families would gather and big bonfires were lit. Fish and meat were dipped into the boiling vats of oil to cook, a crispy fried delicacy. And you guessed it, the jug was passed around as the whalemen, no doubt, were told of the day's triumph. A large well can produce 50 barrels of oil, each barrel containing roughly 32 gallons. That's a total of 1,500 gallons per whale. At the end of the whaling season, all, and after the oil and baleen had been carted off to the warehouses of Northwest Harbor to await shipment to New York, Boston, here's the triworks of the against it. Uh, Boston, London, the owners at that point would calculate how much each whale earned. The first half share went to the owners, the other half was divided up among the whaling crew. Although each year could differ greatly, if a whaling company had a good year and took 10 whales, each whaleman would have more than enough money to live off of and then some. So again, it was serious dough to anyone who wanted to take the risk. It could be argued that the American Revolution had its first roots in whaling. When the English governor demanded an exorbitant tax for every royal well taken, early bonkers got pissed off. <laughs> Samuel Fishhooks Mulford in 1711 became enraged when his two sons were arrested by the governor of New York for failing to pay taxes on their whale oil in Baleen. The plucky white-haired skipper had had enough of the unfair taxes that were ruining the budding whaling industry. Mulford lived in East Hampton, but was a legislator in the government of the colony of New York. He was also a whale oil merchant. He had busy <coughs> warehouses along Northwest Harbor, East Hampton's main port at the time. The British governor of New York required every whaling company to buy a license from him and claim one quarter of all their whale oil and bone. In addition, the tax to whale oil had to be brought to the royal port of New York. To get around this, many bonnikers sold their oil to Boston and Connecticut to avoid the tax. The governor accused several whalers, including Mulford, of cheating him and hauled them into court. Mulford, then in his early 70s, had appeared in court over 15 times, and his son's arrest was the final straw. He decided to take the complaints directly to the King of England himself and sail to London. When he reached London, he found himself in a proud, sophisticated city where the government doors were shut to an East Hampton whaler dressed in homespun clothes. Worse yet, the skipper had his pockets picked several times on the streets. Striking back with Yankee ingenuity, Mulford sewed fish hooks into his pockets. So, when the next pickpocket tried to steal the whaler's money, his hand was caught fast in the fish hooks, and Mulford held on to him with an iron grip until he could be turned over to the authorities. The incident immediately became London gossip and was reported in all the newspapers. The old bonnet whaler became an overnight star. Now, instead of being shunned, the skipper became a celebrity of sorts and was allowed to plead his case. He met with King George and addressed the House of Commons when he said, The custom of whale fishing is free. It is an ancient custom, more ancient than the colony of New York, and not in any man's memory to the contrary, till of lately. The taxes were revoked, and Captain Fishhooks Mulford returned to East Hampton a hero. He lived at the historic Mulford farmhouse in East Hampton, which is preserved as a museum. Well off! Well off! <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, a tinder... The American Revolution had its early roots in Long Island's coastal whaling, 
when whale oil was one of the first commodities to be unfairly taxed. So I have to give a quick shout out to the famous Patriot whale boat raid on British occupied Sag Harbor in 1777, called the Battle of Sag Harbor. This extraordinary mission could easily be its own lecture, but here it is in a nutshell. Patriot Colonel Miggs, under the direction of George Washington, set out from New Haven, Connecticut, with 130 men and 15 whale boats. Most of these men and boats were recruited from East Hampton, tough bonnikers who knew how to handle a whale boat on rough seas. On the night of May 27th, under the cover of darkness, the 15 whale boats rowed across choppy Long Island Sound, landed in Orient, dragged the boat across to Peconic Bay, and about midnight reached Sag Harbor. The Patriots quickly and quietly marched to the small British fort near where the old whaler's church is today. The Yankees attacked, and there was a brisk fight where a handful of British soldiers were killed and 50 captured. The American Patriots then burned a dozen British ships in the harbor. A few high-ranking officers were also captured at the building which is today the American Hotel. Not an American was killed or wounded, and the Patriots and their prisoners safely returned to Connecticut. All in all, it was one of the only continental victories on Long Island during the American Revolution, and was done so on the broad, strong backs of East Hampton whalemen and their small but tough, versatile vessels. You're welcome, Sag Harbor. <laughs> Alright, you gotta take a minute to make a connection to this architectural historical beauty that we're all lucky enough to be in tonight. Twice saved, this building is just the spear tip of an incredible life-saving tradition here in East Hampton. I want to make a quick tie in with the whaling tradition I've been rambling on about tonight. The men who lived and worked in this building, built in 1902, were the sons and grandsons and great-grandsons of East Hampton whalers. Bennetts, Lopers, Millers, Lesters, Osbournes, Edwards, Talmages, Conklings, Bakers, Barnes, Daytons, Schellingers. Any relatives, any families here tonight? Any whaler families? Yeah. Nobody leave anybody out. <laughs> Going back to those first whale watchers and lookouts and patrols that watch for whales, what else do you think that they were on the lookout for? Yes, ships who in trouble, who needed help. Ships that were caught out on the outer bar or dragged into the shallow water. Over and over, records show these early whalemen traded roles in a heartbeat from predator to savior, using the same seamanship to paddle out to a vessel in distress as it took to catch a whale. These men were courageous and self-sacrificing no matter what they were after. Since researching for tonight, I have grown to consider the early shore whalers an important siege of the early life-saving stations and ultimately today's Coast Guard. Brave men not afraid to paddle out into the ocean swells to help a stranger. Similar to Johnny Ryan's East Hampton Town lifeguards today. <laughs> Around 1780, the focus of whaling on Eastern Long Island shifted from our beaches to Sag Harbor with its new Long Wharf and Deep Harbor. Also, the northern right whale population had plummeted. Many young East Hampton shore whalers joined Sag Harbor whaling crews as coveted, experienced whalemen. Among the most sought after on those long voyages were the Shinnecocks and the Montaukets. One of the last and most famous Amagansett whalers was Joshua, Captain Joshua Edwards, known as Captain Josh. He lived from 1830 until 1915 and was a <clears throat> legendary whaler. The Edwards were one of those first families in East Hampton that lived off what they could grow or catch. A large handful of that big family became successful whalemen. Another reason Captain Josh was so respected as he also traveled to every corner of the globe on a number of whaling hunts. When he came back to Amagansett, it was easy for him to set up the whaling companies. All right, so here's one last story before I wrap up. New York City's Museum of Natural History and East Hampton whaling paths are firmly linked. February 1907, when Dr. H.C. Bumpers, director of the museum, had read about a whale that had been killed on the east end by Captain Joshua Edwards. The 78-year-old whaler was at the end of his whaling career, but not at the end of his fame. And here he is, um, he's kind of sharpening a, 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 a whale spade. Dr. Bumpers wanted to acquire from Captain Josh the whale skeleton for exhibition at the museum. By the time a museum representative arrived in Amagansett, the blubber had been removed and the carcass and all 50, 54 feet of it sat, sank slowly into the sand. The whale was the largest right whale ever recorded at that time. The skeleton would be of great importance, but how could they get it back to New York? The temperature was 20 degrees and a tough wind was tearing across the beach. The carcass, even with the blubber removed, still weighed almost 50 tons. Mm -hmm. wow. The museum hired local bonnikers, Captain Josh and his family and friends, to hack carefully at the remaining carcass, removing the bones. This is a photograph from that whale. 
Then without warning, a storm came out of the west. The waves crashed into the carcass. The workmen had furiously anchored the beast to the beach, hoping it would not be washed away. The storm lasted for three days, and when it was over, the whale was gone. The anchoring ropes were there, but no whale. The ropes were still taut. The whale was buried beneath the sand. The temperature that day was only 12 degrees as the work crew labored to remove the remaining bones out of the freezing water and sand. And they did it, retrieving every last bone. For many years, the skeleton of Captain Josh's whale hung at the Museum of Natural History in New York City to educate and enthrall visitors. Believe it or not, just recently there has been talk about bringing that skeleton back to East Like so many wild creatures fate, whales have become became less common off our beaches with overhunting. Before whaling, it is estimated there are over 20,000 Atlantic right whales. Today, they hover around 400. Humans continue to be their worst enemy, but there is hope now that they are protected and their population is slowly gaining ground. Growing up out here, I don't ever remember seeing whales off our beaches, but during the past few summers, we begin to see them again. Anyone seen a whale Whale! last summer? Whale! 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 I'm glad my kids will grow up in East Hampton that got its whales back. If we want whales to survive today, we have to apply our knowledge of whaling history to our future decisions affecting our waters. Every time we champion cleaner and quieter waters, we are saying thank you, and more importantly, welcome back. It's been a real privilege speaking with you folks tonight. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.